I am presenting Union Gospel Press's Sunday School Lesson Number 4, Sunday, September 22nd, 2024. The lesson is entitled, Daniel Prophecies the Son of Man. Lesson text comes from Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 14. Related scriptures are Mark 9, 2 through 10, Revelations 1, 9 through 16, and 20, 11 through 15. The place is Babylon. The time is probably 553 BC. In this quarter, we are studying two prophets, Daniel and Jonah, who provide examples of how we should and should not relate to the world. They also show how the kingdoms of this world relate to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Daniel teaches us about the kingdom of God under the reign of the Messiah. This is something we as Christians can look forward to with joy. Today's aim, facts. To show students that through Daniel's vision, we see ahead of us a ruler and a kingdom that do not end. Principle, to teach that Jesus will rule forever and ever. Application, to show that as Christians, we can rejoice because our Lord will bring all things under his control. Illustrating the lesson. The chaos in the world today is setting the stage for the glorious reign of the King of Kings. Practical points. One, God's holiness will be on display at the day of judgment, Daniel 7, 9. Two, one day heaven's books will be opened and there will be no escaping their verdict, verse 10. Three, no human dominion, no matter how seemingly impregnable, is safe from God's judgment, verses 11 through 12. Four, the appearance of the Son of Man is the climax of history and changes how we should understand the world today, verse 13. Five, the everlasting dominion that has been given to the Son of Man is our greatest and final hope, verse 14. Golden text. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, Daniel 7, 13. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is a sovereign Lord, Daniel 7, 9 through 10. The second is slain beast, Daniel 7, 11 through 12. And the third is a son of man, Daniel 7, 13 through 14. Introduction. The first half of Daniel consists largely of stories about Daniel and his friends' faithfulness in Babylon. The book opens with Daniel and his three friends refusing the royal menu, honoring their choice. God blessed them with better health than those who ate and drank the king's food and wine. In chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to the king's golden image and were rescued by God from the king's wrath. In chapter 4, which we did not cover, Nebuchadnezzar was humbled and he repented and worshipped God. Years later, King Belshazzar saw a handwriting something on a wall, Daniel 5. Only Daniel could interpret the writing, which revealed that Babylon would fall to the Medes and Persians. Even under Persian rule, Daniel had a prominent position. Some, however, tricked Darius into signing a law that led to Daniel's overnight stay in a den of lions, but God rescued him, Daniel 6. Beginning with chapter 7, the book shifts its focus from historical narratives to Daniel's apocalyptic visions. Sovereign Lord, Daniel 7, 9. And I beheld till the thorns were cast down, till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire, verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, thousands of 
thousands ministered unto him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. Apocalyptic vision, Daniel 9, Daniel 7, 9. At points in Jewish history, apocalyptic literature was very popular. Within the Bible, there are parts of several books that fall into this category, including Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Revelations, and Matthew 24 and 25, sometimes called the Little Apocalypse. F failing to distinguish genres, when reading scripture can lead to great confusion. If something is intended literally, we should read it literally. If something is intended poetically, such as Psalms, we should read it as poetry. Hence, we do not read Revelation the same way we read Genesis or study Psalms the same way we do Acts. There are a number of common characteristics of apocalyptic writings which apply to both biblical and non-biblical books. Among them are the following. One, there is an emphasis on eschatological, that is, the end of the age. Two, a messianic figure or other deliverer is sometimes central. Three, visions and dreams are common. Sometimes the writings are deliberately mysterious because they are written during the time of oppressive powers. Four, angels often play a role in the unfolding drama. Five, symbolism related to animals and numbers is common. Six, a cosmic struggle between good and evil. Since apocalyptic literature uses many symbols, great care should be taken in interpreting these portions of scripture. Godly Bible scholars often have strong disagreements over certain prophetic texts. Thus, we should not be dogmatic concerning some biblical passages, especially those that describe things that have not yet occurred. As Daniel 7 opens, we learn that the prophet had a vision of four beasts that came out of the sea, verse 3. The fourth beast was dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, verse 7. It was more powerful than the beast that came before it. Unlike the other beasts, it had ten horns representing ten kings, verse 24. If you have some familiarity with Revelation, you know that it has similar visions. Often overlooked is the fact that nearly every symbol found in the final book of the Bible is also found in the Old Testament, especially in Daniel and Ezekiel's apocalyptic sections. Most interpreters understand the four beasts of Daniel 7, along with Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a great image in chapter 2, to be representative of four empires, Babylon, Medio, Persia, Greece, and Rome. While some identify the little horn, 7-8, with, with Ant Antichias, Epiphanes, and Solicide, Greek ruler who sought to destroy Judaism in the second century BC. Others see this as a reference to the future Antichrist. In contrast to the one who had a mouth speaking great things, verse 8, Daniel saw the Ancient of Days, verse 9, take his place upon the throne. This was the Almighty himself. The observation that thrones were cast down, verse 9, simply means that they were put in place as thrones of judgment. The description of the Ancient of Days wearing a white garment and having hair like wool is similar to the John's vision of the risen Christ, Revelations 1, 12 through 20. The fiery throne and wheels are similar to Ezekiel's vision of God's throne, Ezekiel 1, 4 through 28. The reason for the similarities is that these prophets caught a glimpse of the same thing, the glory of God. The depiction of the Almighty with white hair and a white garment speaks of his holiness and purity. 
Fire often depicts God's presence. No wonder Isaiah thought that he was about to die when he had a vision of the throne of God. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. Such visions caused Daniel to, to be faint and physically ill. Daniel 8, 27. Peter, James, and John likewise amazed were likewise amazed when they saw a glimpse of Christ's heavenly glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, Mark 9, 2 through 8. Awesome judgment, Daniel 7, 10. As Daniel continued his description of what he saw, he noted that a fiery stream, verse 10, flowed from the presence of the Ancient of Days. The fire represents the brilliant manifestation of his splendor, as well as the fierce heat of his judgment. As Hebrews 12, 29 says, our God is a consuming fire. Daniel also saw th thousands of angels serving him, as well as 10,000 upon 10,000 more standing before him awaiting the judgment. An enormous crowd stands by as the heavenly court convenes for the examination and conviction of the rebellious little horn. The final world dictator and his followers like the scene in revelation 2012 the books were opened daniel 7 10 that all humanity will stand in judgment before god is taught throughout scripture daniel 12 1 through 4 matthew 25 31 through 46 acts 10 42 and 17 31 romans 14 10 through 11 second corinthians 5 10 Hebrews 9 27. The scene in Daniel, however, may be primarily concerned with the wicked who had followed the little horn that is the Antichrist. Revelations 13 1 through 4, 19, 19 through 21. As Revelations 2012 says, the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. To be clear, our works cannot save us. Romans 3.20, Galatians 2.16, Ephesians 2.9, 2 Timothy 1.9. As Christians, however, our works validate our faith and are necessary to Christian service. Galatians 5.6, Ephesians 2.10, James 2.14-26. The judgment of believers will determine eternal rewards. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Not, not internal destiny. Slain beasts. Verse 11. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Verse 12. As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Doom sealed. Daniel 7, 11. The horn in Daniel's vision continued to speak great words, verse 11, until the very end. The blasphemous beast spewed out his boasting against humans and God till the very moment he is dragged before the heavenly tribunal. This might be this might be analogous to be convicted mass murderer who rants even as he is being led to execution chamber. In the case of the horn, there is no remorse for his evil deeds as he is brought before the judge of the universe. The slaying of the beast and his consignment to the flames are likewise depicted in Revelation. And the beast was taken away, and with him the, the false prophet. These both were cast alive into a lake of burning fire with brimstone, 1920. The fate of the beast should be a warning to all who arrogantly rise up against the God of heaven. As Jesus said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. Suggesting the possibility of eternal judgment in our society is labeled as narrow-minded and judgmental. 
To be sure, God is the final judge, and we do not want to take divine rights upon ourselves. Ultimately, we do not know the state of other souls before God. To, to fall, to fail to say anything about divine judgment, however, is to place ourselves in a precarious position. Ezekiel 33, 1 through 9. We are to declare all the counsel of God, Acts 20, 27, which includes that Jesus Christ will judge the quick and the dead at his appearance and his kingdom, 2 Timothy 4, 1. Dominion taken, Daniel 7, 12. The other beast Daniel saw in his vision, verses 3 through 6, had their authority removed, but they continued in some manner. This may mean that the cultures of each of the first three conquered empires were, were assimilated into the conquering nations. Still, as students of the book of Daniel realize there is not complete agreement among interpreters concerning some of the details of Daniel's visions. Son of Man, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, verse 14. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion and everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Clouds in heaven, Daniel 7:13. Though there may be minor disagreement concerning the identification of the various beasts and the little horn, the New Testament makes it clear that the one like the Son of Man, verse 13, refers to the Lord Jesus. While Son of Man was a common Jewish way to refer to a human being, the one who came into the presence of the ancient of days was not merely human. This was the most common little title Jesus used to describe himself. It appears about 80 times in the Gospels. In using this designation, perhaps Christ revealed his identity to the unbelieving while revealing it to those awaiting the Messiah. It is clear that Daniel 7.13, the Son of Man, is a messianic title. He comes with the clouds of heaven, re receives an everlasting kingdom, and all peoples shall serve him. Even in the Old Testament, there is a vivid picture of Christ, which, could, which God made clearer to his people over time. When we turn to the pages of the New Testament, the image of Daniel's son of man suddenly comes into clear focus. Matthew 19, 28, 26, 64, Mark 3, 26, Revelations 1, 7. Clouds in scriptures are sometimes associated with judgment. Jeremiah described the Babylonian armies descending on Judah as if they were clouds. Jeremiah 4, 13. The visions of Zephaniah and Joel also draw a parallel between dark clouds and Judah's doom. Zephaniah 1.15, Joel 2.2. Such imagery is certainly appropriate for the judgment meted out by Christ in the end times. In the Old Testament, only God rides on the clouds. When Jesus appropriated the text to himself, the high priest recognized it as a claim to deity and proclaimed that Jesus' statement was blasphemous. The, the personage who appears before God in the form of a human being is of heavenly origin. He comes to the place of ordination, coordination, accompanied by the clouds of heaven and is clearly no mere human being in essence. The expression, like a son of man, identifies this final ruler of the world not only as human. In contrast to the beast, the four world empires, but also as the heavenly sovereign incarnate. Daniel's vision captures Jesus' humanity and divinity. Coming kingdom, Daniel 7, 14. In Daniel, in Daniel 2, 
King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a great image. The four portions of the statue each represented a different kingdom, verses 31 through 40. Almost certainly the same as those represented by the four beasts of chapter 7. During the reign of the final kingdom, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and it shall stand forever, 224. This is the same message given in 714, where the prophet was told that his kingdom shall not be destroyed. Concerning the kingdom of Christ, there is both a present aspect and a future manifestation. Since God's kingdom is present in Christ, there is a sense in which the kingdom came during his earthly ministry. Mark 1 15, Luke 11 20, 17 21. Many references, however, look forward to a future kingdom having both earthly and eternal manifestations. This future aspect of Christ's kingdom is likely what is primarily in view in Daniel 7.14. Unlike the passing kingdoms described in Daniel, Christ's kingdom will be universal, encompassing all peoples, languages, and nations. A similar description is given in Revelation concerning those who came out of the Great Tribulation, 714. They hail from all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, and stand before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, verse 9. Indeed, the kingdoms of this world will be swallowed up by Christ's kingdom. The kingdoms of this world world are are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever 1115 there will come a day when the kingdom of God will be gloriously consummated meanwhile believers are to be agents of God's kingdom this is spelled out in the sermon on the mount as Jesus taught that the meek will inherit the earth the merciful are blessed and those who mourn will be comforted while awaiting Jesus is coming we are to be salt and and light and uphold a higher standard of holiness. We are to be planted as seeds that produce a plentiful harvest. To such as these, the kingdom of heaven belongs. Matthew 5, 3 through 20, 13, 23. Questions. One, should we always read the Bible literally? Two, what are some characteristics of apocalyptic literature? Why is this important when studying certain biblical books? Three, what kind of connections are there between Daniel and Revelation? Four, what is represented by the four beasts in Daniel 7 and the four sections of the statue in chapter 2? Five, who is the Ancient of Days? Six, what was the purpose of the books being opened at the judgment? Seven, who is the son of man? What is the meaning of this expression? Eight, what is the significance of the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven? Nine, how is the kingdom of God used in the Bible? Ten, what kind of kingdom was given to the Son of Man? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, September 22nd, 2024. Thank you for listening. God bless.